when I grew up, we used to go to the community halls, you know, the Piri halls, the Mapeta, Uncle Tom's Hall, Donaldson, DOCC, YMCA, to attend concerts, to participate in concerts and things like that. And yeah, during the 70s and the 80s that disappeared. But there is a recognition now. We need to revitalize the cultural life of Soweto. So, yes, it is very special for me to go back and perform in Soweto because I haven't done it in a very, very long time. And, and <sighs> it makes me sad. But then I suppose it doesn't help to be sad, right? One has to do something about it. So, hey, I'm going back there. Soweto means my life, and I lack words uh, to explain what attachment I have to Soweto. Soweto who have lived a life of oppression, I want you to imagine it, how you think I feel as a person who has participated in the struggle to do it. Because it was a uniting center of our people. And it is here where we created the revolution, where we created the liberation movement, where we finally emerged as people who were successful in that revolution. I remember when we buried my mother, you know, uh, we, we went to Avalon Cemetery, and those were the days of the political funerals. And as would happen, there were two or three funerals of a political nature that day, when my mother was buried and you had all these, these kids running and stuff, if you remember what used to happen. And uh, I can't ever forget that. And we had to bury the old girl in a bit of a rush, because then there was a tear gas and stuff. And it was quite, it was quite extraordinary. And I mean, and that, that makes me, you know, feel close to, I guess, to, to, to Soweto. I know Soweto is a very special place because I guess of what it, it stands for in as far as the whole idea of the resilience of a people means but to me initially it is just home. I was born there, I grew up there, I played in the streets there, I walked to school there. I think about my home, I think about the street I grew up in, Orlando West, Mamburu Street, and I think about the sense of, just the sense of community, the sense that if my parents were not there I could always go to the neighbor's house and have my dinner there, you know. Um, the sense of family that was there, you could come out of school, for instance, go to your neighbor's house, get your key to your parents' home, get inside there, do whatever you do, do change, clean up the house, do the cooking if you're of that age, go out into the street and play, and of course, you know, everybody looked out for everybody else. And just being allowed to be a child. I think that's the one thing that I feel particularly lucky about. We, we were just children. We were allowed to be children. It was demanded of us, in fact, to be children. But we know that 76 changed all of that for a lot of children. For the children of Soweto, Wednesday, June 16, 1976, began as any other day. By nightfall, their actions had determined the course of history in South Africa and emblazoned indelibly Soweto as an icon of the struggle against apartheid on the consciousness of the world.
13-year-old Hector Peterson was the first victim of police shootings. The conflict spread to other townships and some 700 people lost their lives, some 400 killed by police action in Soweto. Two decades later, today Soweto generates the phenomenon of political tourism to South Africa. Students in 1976 came from all over Soweto to convene in this area so as to take a memorandum or a petition to Johannesburg complaining about enforcement of Africans on students and education. Their peaceful march was intercepted by police who shot at them with live ammunition. About this site is uh, a very important site in the sense that it celebrates the lives and the sacrifices of the hundreds of students who lost their lives during the 1976 and 1977 period. We have a theme for the side we say never again, or for what we also call the point of no return, because after June 1976, we never look back. And uh, the site uh, really tells the story so that uh, we should keep uh, reminding ourselves and remember where we come from. This is where uh, Hector Peterson fell, finally. He was shot down the road, and then Mbuisa, Makubu, and Clinton uh, Hector's sister, as they came running from the spot where they were shot, this is where they finally fell. Uh, what I can say is that uh, my son died for the, for the nation. Yes, I'm proud because it happens. I cannot, what can I say? But, I feel all right because the, it's a symbol to the other uh, generation coming, then they know what happened on 1976. There isn't anything I would ever forget about that day. And we got off at Pefferty Station, there was a, a kiosk there where they used to sell newspapers, and there was my son carrying this boy. We thought it was my other son because he was the same age as my other little boy, because there were no names then. Yeah, it was terrible. The police had left the country in August of 1976 because the police were after him, you know. They claimed that he posed for the picture that was taken by Sam. Uh, the problem is when they were denying that they were killing the children, they couldn't deny the picture. And I heard from him up to 1978 in June that he was in Nigeria at school there and he complained of ill health. He said things didn't quite go well with his health. That was the last letter I received from him. That was June 1978. I've never heard from him or about him ever since. After the uh, shooting of Hector Peterson, Soweto was never the same again. Had it not been for those children, those men who were sitting on Robben Island, would never have come out. We are free today because of those children. We are from uh, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Until you've been here, I think, you can't realize what has happened. It's just trying to understand. You've been growing up with this uh, for years already, and, um, and I've seen the television stories day by day. I think you need to really understand and see and feel what is going on, what they're all about. You can see this, uh, these pictures, I think, they give you a perfect image of what went there. How many people were killed, it's amazing. The students then also didn't want photographers around because they feared that they might be identified with photographs. I explained to them, I said, a struggle that is not documented is no struggle. So the world has to know. Your families, the, your community has to know what is going on. This school that you see here, that's where the first uprisings of Soweto began in 1976. Soweto is the 16th most popular tourist attraction in South Africa. It brings over a thousand visitors a day, which is uh, higher than uh, the whole Eastern Cape higher than Sun City, so it is a very significant attraction. I have this for, for 15 each, but if you take two, I give two for 25 rand. I honestly believe that the rebellion by the students in 1976 
was absolutely crucial. Crucial in changing the thinking, particularly in the minds of black South Africans who had thought up to then there was nothing they could do. And this rebellion in 1976 seemed to have triggered in the African mind, both adult and young, the idea that in fact something can be done. June 76 was a long time coming. The seeds of urban black oppression planted in Orlando East in 1931, when the first wave of black families relocated from white Johannesburg arrived to faceless rows of identical two-roomed houses. Known initially as Orlando, it was a workforce camp to provide exploitable black labor for South Africa's city of gold. As the then opposition, we went to the polls. In 1948, the incoming Nationalist Party government consolidated this relocation process, and by 1954, all black families informally living in Johannesburg were being moved to Orlando. As the future Soweto grew, so too did resistance to apartheid giving rise to the historic Cliptown Charter, a declaration that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white together. I can't uh, forget Cliptown Charter. It's one of the greatest documents we have produced, the Freedom Charter. That was the 26th of June. So I was banned, Nelson was also banned. We made attempts to go to Cliptown and not to be part as such, but to be transferred. And that's how it was. Nelson and I watched the whole operation in Cliptown and under those conditions. We were then, we then not uh, sufficed. Uh, without risking arrest. To provide housing for Bantu workers at a reasonable cost is an undertaking of vast magnitude, but it pays dividends in the form of the orderly growth and development of our cities and towns. Order out of chaos. By 1956, forced relocations were in full swing and government propaganda paved the way for the final phase, as established freehold communities such as Safiatown were targeted. In spite of protests spearheaded by Archbishop Trevor Huddleston, some 24,000 households were forcibly removed to Dipkloof and Meadowlands. In the heart of Johannesburg, places like Safiatown, Martindale, Nuclear and Pageview, which for years had been a threat to the public health and safety, were tackled with vigor and energy. It was alleged by some Europeans that the Bantu would refuse to move. In fact, such an idea never existed in the minds of the Bantu who were living in these shanties. It seems strange that a few Europeans could actually have pleaded for the retention of these conditions. Order out of chaos. Lorries transport the rejoicing Bantu whose hearts are filled with happy expectation. They're on their way to a new residential quarter, a new home. Since we left our beloved Safari Town, we had no choice, you know, to go and stay a so we too. And there was no knocking like we knocked like a gentleman, you know. It was just kicking the doors. Hey, my little hoo, my little hoo, so come first, my little hoo. They didn't want no piece of. And they didn't you complaining and bad, 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 you know. And <laughs> just pathetic. I remember when my father was crying when he was taking the water up on top of the van, whatever, and saying we must stand one place, we mustn't move because children were crying this side, women were crying this side. Because leaving so far time to them, it was something. And leaving friends behind that we loved, it was very hurting. You were not staying with your neighbor when you left so far time. You missed even your families, your friends. You see them after maybe a year because you are looking, because there were no addresses given. You know, so far time happened at a time not very long after the Second World War. 
a time of certain freedoms which people believe was were going to happen. To the extent too that uh, you know there was a belief that you know that um, apartheid was a nightmare which was going to go very soon, and nobody took apartheid particularly serious those days. But the mood changed when we moved to Soweto. Obviously, people from Sofatan were very angry to have been moved there. Uh, but the whole of that area called Soweto became a very unhappy place, quite frankly, to live in. They hurry to unload and move in. This is great fun, and everybody lends a hand. By 1960, the relocation process was complete. And in 1963, this sprawling grey expanse of faceless houses known as Southwestern Townships was officially dubbed Soweto. But in those grey, dusty streets, the vibrancy and tradition of Sophia Town took root, giving birth to a memorable era of creative expression through music, literature and the arts. The band! <laughs> It's just music, mixture of music, all sorts of music, and there was a lot of jazz impersonating the Americans in overseas, and they would wear those big hats and looking very posh and open coupe cars. They would just play jazz in the car, just showing off, having a good time. <laughs> singing Cow Cow Boogie, and I was doing Jitterbug with Duba Duba, the third, 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 third guy, also passed away. I, I used to sing for the Harlem Singsters. We used to go to a hall where they used to play Harlem Singsters, the Jazz Maniacs, Sophie Mgrena and them, Api Geirko Becker and them, Dolly Ratebe, you name them. All of us, you know, we used to go there on a Sunday to go and do Jitterbug, and we used to dress sportswear. If you want to know what is where, that's where. You could find it from us, you know, because we're impersonating the Americans. My parents used to talk to me about the Manhattan Brothers, the Jazz Maniacs, Hugh Masekela, Jonas Kwangwa. Kipi was always been spoken about a lot. And of course, the uh, Merry Blackbirds with the late Uncle Peter Rezant. The late Jackson calls he let me special spokes machine. Now there was a, this little box that the authorities gave to the black people to wake us up in the morning, go to school and go to work. And this is where we'd hear most of the music. Miriam McKenna was probably the queen of song at that. Dorothy Masuka and uh, Tandy Klassen, uh, Sophie Wittina, Abigail Kubeka. I mean, the list is endless. And of course, Dolly Rattabu was the most beautiful woman that all of our fathers would really love to take out for dinner. And, uh, and Makay Davashi, the great composer. And I think at that time, King Kong was beginning to happen. It was the major musical. And of course, most of the great musicians we heard about, we spoke about, were part of that. King Kong was a boxer, black South African heavyweight champion of 1953. A giant of a man with a dark side, his momentary triumphs caught the imagination and made him the folk hero of the day. Written by Todd Machikiza, King Kong, the jazz opera, was the West Side story of Soweto. At one stage destined for Broadway, the show was a great success in South Africa and internationally played at the Princess Theatre in London. We used to not only stay in Soweto, obviously, we, we came to the city of Johannesburg. There was a place called Dokey House, where they actually started the King Kong thing. And my brother was a musician too, so we hung around people like Juma Sikel and all these guys and Miriam Akeva at uh, those areas. And uh, we had a good time, and even those days. But I met people like, you know, Mangat Nakasa, Louis Nkosi. I, I we actually met Chantemba, who was like the real intellectual guru of all time, in fact, for, as far as we're concerned. And uh, we wanted to be like them. It was also the days of a kind of a, a renaissance, really, in black writing and the arts, the jazz from the States, you know, the music, the Americanisms, what we assumed, the books we read about all of this. My father, who, who is a retired professor of music, 
his generation, we sort of crudely refer to them as the royal reader, you know, those very educated lot. He's of the same generation as the Sophia Town, the drum writers, you know, the Zeke Mpahleles, the Ken Tembers, the Todd Majigizas, all of those people. They had a syndicate of African artists or whatever they called it in those days. And the appreciation of the arts to them was a vital, a vital part of the development of a person. My father took us to a school of violin which was established in Soweto in 1965 by my uncle Michael Masote. And, uh, you know, that in, in itself, I mean, was a kind of strange experience for me and my peers at the time because they couldn't understand that uh, what is a violin? I mean, most of them had, hadn't seen a violin before. Did he? Not you. You can actually lean, lean there and really exaggerate. You know, a, a cheeky band, you know. There was a lot of music in that house. We used to play a lot of uh, chamber music, choral music. Uh, we used to sing a lot also as uh, an entire family. There is this misunderstanding that, you know, Soweto is rough, full stop. That is not true. Soweto is a very profound place. <laughs> to go up in Soweto, you actually meet, you know, a different people from different tribes and different languages and different cultures within the black community. And uh, to be able to live as one, it enriches you, musically particularly. What I used to enjoy mostly was, you know, the so-called hostels, which are compounds, you know. Every Sunday, we used to go down to do a hostel watch, you know, these traditional people, you know, the Zulus, the Zwanas, the Bedis, you know, do their traditional music and dance. In fact, this is where I saw the first man, black, playing a violin, Zulu style. And I was amazed because, you know, by that time I had already started, you know, taking violin lessons. So I watched this guy. For some time, hostel dwellers and township residents coexisted peacefully, but ethnically based hostels were ripe for political manipulation by third force elements. Hostel dwellers were men from the rural areas, forced by government legislation to leave their wives and families and exist in the squalor and degradation of single sex hostels. It was a dehumanizing experience. In some hostels, there were no beds, and the men were accommodated on rows of concrete bunks built into the walls. As hostel dwellers became marginalized from the township community, hostels became a breeding ground for crime and violence. When we moved to Meadowlands, we, we were not very happy about the thing. And then what the government then did was to build hostels around the townships, which, I don't know, it was a fiendishly clever thing to do for them. You know, I mean, I don't even know if they were aware of it, because it started this fight between the so-called hostel dwellers and the township people. And I remember very well uh, the early days in Meadowlands where we were, how the so-called Zulu guys from the hostel in, the, in Dube used to attack our homes. And, and it was a frightening situation of what was later to become black on black, black violence, as it was called. Uh, and that stands out very clearly in, in my mind. <laughs> You look on the left hand side, all these compounds that you see on the left hand side. That, but the government is turning these into family units so that these people can, they can live with their loved ones. 
The Council is upgrading hostel complexes so that hostel dwellers can ultimately take ownership of converted family units and live a normal life with their wives and children. It is a sensitive process. While most welcome the move, there are those who have learned to live in two worlds and who wish to keep their urban and rural lives separate. Assurances have had to be given that no one will be displaced during the conversion process. Involving all stakeholders, some 40 million rands worth of upgrading has so far been completed. <laughs> In 1960, the watershed event that reverberated around the world, awakening international understanding of oppression in South Africa, started its day in the dusty streets of Soweto. In the dawning hours of Monday morning, the 21st of March, 1960, Robert Sabukwe left his home in Mofolo and began the five-kilometer walk to the Orlando police station to personally put into practice his nationwide call for a decisive, non-violent campaign against the pass laws. On March 21st, I met up with the hierarchy of uh, the PAC, led by Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe, who handed themselves over to the police station in Orlando. That was his last day in Soweto. You know, he died outside of Soweto. As president of the Pan-Africanist Congress, Sobukwe had called on all black South Africans on that day to leave their passbooks at home walk to the nearest police station and demand arrest. Heeding his call, people gathered at police stations around the country, handing themselves over for arrest. In Sharpville, police opened fire. I had never seen so many people dead. I was shocked. I could not do justice to my photography. As a result, when I got to the office, Tom Hopkinson, who was uh, my editor, said, um, you have pictures, but um, the, a picture that I would love to see is a close-up of a bullet sticking out of someone's bone, of someone's hand standing up, you know. Someone's glasses have fallen down. I don't see this said to me, if I didn't think you had the potential of being a photographer one day, I would fire you on the spot. And the man was very serious. And um, from that day, I changed my methods of uh, photographing any event. I don't get emotionally involved. One of the things I must just mention, obviously, is that while people had this feeling that uh, apartheid was going to be a passing phase and it was going to end soon, the, the realization that these chaps were serious came in 1960 when people were shot in Chapville and everybody began to realize this was a very serious thing. Naturally, after that, uh, our people then in Soweto and other places began to realize that the fight was on. And it wasn't just a little fight, it was a very, it was a very bad fight. 69 people were killed and hundreds wounded in police gunfire that shattered the last fragile hopes for peaceful change in South Africa that day. Nonviolent struggle had failed, but monuments to these efforts remain. Sabukwe's house, the Orlando Communal Hall, where strategic ANC and PAC meetings were held, and Villakazi Street, where the first blood was spilled in 1976 and perhaps the only street in the world graced by the homes of two Nobel Peace Prize winners, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and past President Nelson Mandela. Very interesting document on a wall from the state of Michigan, a letter from the legislature of Michigan to the then President Bush, asking him to apologize to Mandela for the alleged role the CIA played in his arrest. <clears throat> of course, none forthcoming. The CIA does not... Uh, Acknowledge doing anything, so they don't apologize. Now let's carry on. You can come back and uh, have a look at uh, specific items if you want. If you look around the house, uh, it's perforated uh, with the uh, bullet holes. Uh, we waged a lot of wars here. I had personal and direct involvement with the security forces at the time. 
and they knew I was involved in the underground. And I personally uh, commanded thousands of youths in this country underground here yeah, to the best of my ability. And um, what you see here are relics of the past. Um, this pair of boots is, for instance, my very own, uh, which I wore during the Liberation War. It is a fulfillment of that dream just to show, to have a little peep of uh, painful yesterday's history, what it was all about. But unfortunately, some of us who were involved in um, exposing the system with our work uh, didn't last long because um, I was then picked up in 69 um, for 586 days in solitary confinement. When I came back, I was then banned, which meant I couldn't do the things that I had been doing. I had to change my life completely. My life was solitude now. Like photographer Peter Magobani, the lives of many everyday people were shattered as the government clamped down on all forms of opposition to apartheid. For the average Sowetan, with no electricity, bucket toilet systems, no shopping facilities, situated far from work opportunities with inadequate public transport, the 60s and early 70s were a bleak time. In spite of this, that enduring human spirit, born out of the ruins of vibrant places like Safayatan, enabled people to struggle through and make the most of their lives. Living in Soweto, people played their radiograms loud, I mean loud. So you heard Miriam Makeba, you heard Leta Mbulu, you heard Carlos Santana, you heard um, Jimi Hendrix. All of, these, all of those influences were there. That, 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 that was the vibrancy that of, of Soweto. That, that was the, the tapestry that was that particular township. So, Yes, there were lots of hard times, but they are really very, very good memories. On the surface, after the turbulence of 1960, the townships were calm, back under control. Political organizations opposed to apartheid had been banned, and black political leaders were incarcerated on Robben Island. Bantu education would ensure white domination for generations to come. At the same time, the suppression and the physical deprivation in which township people lived was silently brewing the revolt that would erupt in black education in June 1976. The stage was being set, and reflecting the bittersweet ironies of the time, a new phenomenon was born, giving expression to these many facets of township life, a new people's art form, township theatre. In all those days, there was still calling a play a sketch of living people or a bioscope of living people. They did not know a play from Adam and Eve. This is why I suppose I'm called the father of black theater because I am the person who actually moved from township to township, you know, staging my, my musicals and theater was initiated into the townships. Because you want that life to sell to the audience and what you do, you delay deliberately and wait for them to react. You killed the last thing last night, you know that? Right. I'm very protective of the suffering of the poor, of the struggling. And secondly, I come from a very, very religious home. I've been influenced, influenced by the church, by the evangelists singing in the streets in the morning. And all those things move me. There was the element of the law those days when we had to have a Dom Pass, a reference book. So basically to me, township theatre was just to expose, you know, the, the life of the man in the street, you know, the struggle of the poor, the struggle against, you know, the past laws, and today adjusting to the promises in all of the new dis dispensation. In the 1970s, Gibson kent his productions were frequently banned and he was detained by the security police. 
From 1976, with the resurgence of the political dimension to the struggle, Kente found himself under fire from sectors of the liberation movement because his productions continued to champion the aspirations and struggles of the individual rather than advocating the sacrifices demanded by political struggle. When uh, I was supposed to have had a play at the Yedu Cinema, and my fans came, you know, in numbers. And some, you know, office from the political structures said, you cannot perform there. Because we don't like the face of the owner of that cinema. Sometime back in the 80s, I had a play, The Hot Road, where I was actually saying, education is the cornerstone. It's a building block. This is what this play was saying. And because the feeling those days was that any education must be disrupted. I was told in Port Elizabeth to get out of there and never set foot there again. Those, those experiences to me are stronger than what the system of those years did to me, locking me up in jail. Those I accepted, but for my people to treat me that way, when I was trying to get the message across. To further exploit the growing tensions between personal aspiration and the sacrifice demanded by political struggle, after the events of 1976, the government determined to create a manageable black middle class in Soweto. It was a divide and rule strategy, which at the same time would introduce cosmetic changes and show the world that reforms were taking place. By lifting certain restrictions on black business opportunities in Soweto, it was intended to create a class of black urban township dweller who would have too much to lose to assist the masses in the struggle for liberation. Cultural and sporting events ever popular amongst the black community would be promoted, and beauty pageants, Mr. Universe contests, and cup finals became the order of the day. Good times would be had, as Sowetans were encouraged to aspire to the good things in life. Black business within Soweto grew, and although in reality the majority of Sowetans remained poor, a group of very wealthy black businessmen emerged. For the first time, Sowetans were allowed to buy and renovate their four-roomed matchbox houses, and the government saw to it that the only new houses built were in areas earmarked for development as middle-class suburbs within Soweto. In this way, a new class of residents concerned with the safety and value of their property emerged. But with cosmetic reform came increased political oppression. In 1981, the Sowetan newspaper was launched, a triumph in the face of the government's efforts to silence the black press. Its predecessor, The World, had been banned in 1977 and its editors detained. The Sowetans survived into the 1980s to headline the violent response by security forces to mass protest at the government's implementation of their tricameral parliament, the final phase in their strategy to create a non-white buffer middle class. It was all-out war as the black youth, sacrificing education for liberation, took on the security forces to make the townships ungovernable and apartheid unworkable. For the everyday township dweller, it became increasingly difficult to remain involved. Everyday issues became politicized. You were either for or against. Confined to the townships, black anger turned inwards. Sellouts were necklaced. In the process, a generation of children, constant witness to violence and death, were becoming brutalized. The cry for nation building underscored the need to heal the wounds of conflict brought about by divisions within the black community. There was a time when, when it was said that the children of the townships of Soweto were the lost generation. 
you know, which um, which is a bit of a presumption, you know, to talk about people are being lost, really. But uh, the reason for that was uh, many of the kids had become very political, and violently so, because the violence began to eat, feed amongst its own amongst its own people, and there was a necklace, and it was it was just it was just too shocking when kids were beginning to kill almost like they enjoyed it. The reasons being being the anger, I think, of, of, of the suspicion that if anybody was watching for the system, then you could get into very serious trouble. And sometimes, even if it was just an allegation, you could get killed, and it happened, you know. And it was, it was awful because uh, it, in a way, brutalized a whole lot of people, including the kids. <laughs> I just hope that um, our children do realize that they have the world in their hands and it is for them to tap this world for their future. Their future is education. Without education, there is nothing that you can do. Without that key, you don't exist. By the end of the 1980s, teaching at township schools had virtually ground to a halt, and today, despite efforts by individual schools to re-inculcate a culture of learning and teaching, generally speaking, township education lies in ruins. With liberation comes expectation, a sense of entitlement. Role models become those who display affluence and not necessarily a sense of values, a strong disincentive to the discipline and commitment required by the process of education. I think the main problems are, first, the children in the school. If you don't feel like coming to school, you don't come to school. If you don't feel like learning in class, no teacher takes like concern. He or she doesn't ask you questions. Why aren't you concentrating in class and all those things? They just don't care. It's your problem. They don't think of the money your parents pay. They just, okay, fine. It's up to him or her and whatever. And then another thing is the crime. Even school children, Maybe like I go to this school, then the next thing I break into the school, I take chairs, but still I come to the school. But then I steal chairs, I steal doors, windows, and everything like that. And they write graffiti all over the walls, and it's a very bad thing for the school. I think I'm going to go to the school, and I'm going to go to the school, and I'm going to go to the school. I'm going to go to the school, and 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 I'm going to go to the like a uh, smoking, taha, gambling, and like into the bad. So they appear, by and large, to be demotivated. There has been the feeling that a culture of entitlement has gripped their minds. Even black students whose families can afford to send them to private schools, they fail in the likes of St. John's and St. Michael's and so on. And it is a thing that needs our urgent attention to begin to re-motivate our children as they were so motivated in the early days, you know, when a black child would walk for miles and miles to school. We've got the young people. After all, in 1998, the best math student in South Africa, I mean the best, was a black student in a little school called St. Mark's in Tafelkorp, Petersburg, who got 400 out of 400 in mathematics. But we need to address the question and not fudge the issue. Because some of us want to be politically correct and talk nonsense. I want to say to young blacks in South Africa, you have a great future ahead of you. But unless you fold up your sleeves, and buckle and do it, the future will sleep by.
dream dreams, be passionate. Don't, mediocrity is not the way, and there is a lot of it around us. That is my problem. It is also a question of how the community is prepared to help those kids aspire to the things that they aspire to as individuals, and, and yet at the same time reminding them of what it is that, that a community, black communities especially, um, have get, how they can anchor them. We never talk about the influence that adults have on their children, and that concerns me. Young people will always do strange things. It, it, it is in the nature of youth. However, it is the responsibility of the parent, of the adult, to monitor that, prune it, direct it, guide it, harness it, and make sure that it settles down. A sense of community, harnessing the potential of youth two attributes of the Soweto that has produced champions in every field, from sport to politics to the arts and business. It is the tradition that materialized Father Huddleston's dream, the swimming pool at Orlando East, made possible by Jake Tooley's generous sense of community, when, from the dusty streets of Soweto, he flew to the United Kingdom to take the British Empire Flyweight Championship in 1952. Many since have followed in his wake confirmation that great things are possible from humble beginnings. It was tough. <laughs> it was tough those years growing up in Soweto. You know, I mean, uh, we didn't have electricity, we didn't have I mean, the facilities to train, you know. But I, I managed to become a world champion in that sort of place. Most of the people who grew up in Soweto today, they can tell you they're a better person in life, you know, growing tough in those conditions in Soweto. And the list is endless of the people who helped me to become where I am today. Jomoston helped me, uh, Sidwell Momalo helped me, Maponya, I mean, Richard Maponya helped me. I mean, a uh, lot of people I mean, so with the, the manager helped me to become where I am today because I, I have to go to them for financial assistance, you know. So my dad, my trainer, Tim Chambu, they helped me a lot. I mean, things have changed. I mean, it's a new generation. You know? I mean, uh, they didn't grow up like, like, like us. Everything is there for them. I mean, that is why when I, when I, when I motivate them at the various schools, gyms, or places, I always say they must, they must, be, they must, be, they must work hard, you know. They must be dedicated and they must be disciplined. They can, touch, they can achieve what they want to achieve in life, you know. I mean, I managed to get my BCom degree from UNISA. Today I'm a world champion three times, and I'm a, one of the businessmen, you know. I remember one time when I went to Sacramento to go and fight Tony Lopez. Uh, all they had to hear about it was the Rose of Soweto internationally, and uh, my life is in Soweto, there's no doubt about it. I was born in Soweto uh, in a township called Shawela. We used to call it Dusty Street of Soweto. It all begins there when, uh, you know, we used to fight with our street mates, friends, to protect ourselves as such, you know. There's a boxing academy in Nansville there, and uh, I, I will believe that uh, most of the boxers come from that academy. I'm one of them, and uh, all my, uh, you know, engagements in, 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 in boxing started there because we will train there, and of course uh, we will compete there to be able, you know, to go and represent greater way to amateur boxing uh, in the federation, in the South African championships, and I became a champion there, and I went all the way up to the world championship. From the dusty greens of Pimville, 22-year-old Bafana Shlope who started out caddying for a friend at this the only golf course in Soweto, is currently within the top 95 rankings in South Africa. Starting out with just one club to his name, once he learned how to play and practicing hard, Bafana started winning junior tournaments and in 1998 turned professional. Currently his goal is to be within the top 65 in the country when he plans to head for Canada, where the greens are greener and the prize money bigger. His ultimate dream is to compete in America and one day take on his current role model, Tiger Woods. Sport is a better thing because you discipline yourself and you get famous on it and you make money. They might just go to school and finish school, then they can decide which thing they want. If they want to play uh, soccer or golf or they just want to go for school and be some lawyers or doctors then they'll just decide for themselves but they must just work hard on it. I'm very proud of Soweto and Pimble. So if I go to Canada then I'll tell them that I'm from Soweto. Even if in America right now it is when I if they introduce me in the corner they say from the left you've got the baby Jake McClellan from Soweto <laughs> It become exciting that at least you know 
they know me I'm from Soweto. Before I quit boxing, they, they say, you know, if I can get a fight in Soweto, uh, you know, Alana Siram or Chablan Amphitheater, one of the big uh, venues in Soweto. I mean, maybe put us four world champions from Soweto in one beat. Just imagine how many people were there, you know. That's my dream. I was released in uh, 15 October 1989. Eh? It's excitement, great excitement. I was, um, after 27 years, going to meet friends, relatives, people who were dear to me. You know, one of the things that uh, fascinates one in jail is the baby. Child crying. A child always reminds you of humanity. You see a child crying, then you feel you are a human being. The fact that there is something like that crying uh, around here makes it a human place to live on. But this house has even a greater history. It is here where we plotted a revolution. It is here where we looked down to the country and the efforts of the people. And because of that, this house has got a sentimental value to me. And um, that's why I find it difficult to, 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 to leave. It is the real history of the people of South Africa. It was the fulfillment of the dreams of our country. It was victory for our people. We had fought for the release of our leaders. I felt at that moment the struggle was worthwhile and the loss of the blood of our children fighting for the liberation of our country had been fulfilled at that particular moment. But for the people of Soweto, the bloodshed was not yet over. Every day, train commuters now became the target of murder and violence as the country, fueled by third force manipulation, spiraled into the bloodiest phase of internecine political violence ever experienced. Station platforms were attacked, and on Soweto trains, gangs of men, armed with shotguns, pangas, and knives, moved from carriage to carriage, hacking, stabbing, shooting, killing or wounding everyone in their path. This insidious third force, bent on destabilizing the forthcoming democratic elections, was responsible for at least 20 such attacks recorded on Soweto trains. 26 people died in the first of these attacks, and more than 100 were injured, as passengers jumped from the trains while others tried to hide under their seats. With the first democratic elections of 1994, as mysteriously as it had arisen, this third force influence disappeared and with it the political violence that had devastated the country for four years. Four brothers, I lost most of my brothers violently in Soweto, you know. So the blood of my family is, uh, my parents are buried there. Uh, I think the, what the violence did, you know, was to make you feel very close to the place. I was this morning driving, I stay in Dobsonville now, and just seeing the kids going to school. I mean, there was such a deep nostalgia for those past days and, and the thing that I can't possibly see me leaving somewhere too for another place, like moving to the suburbs. And it's become a real, like a home, actually. Still the same old dusty streets, you know, with people doing their thing. You, the traffic is still as crazy. The traffic is still as mad. You look across, you see Dube Hostel. You see those women sitting there selling their vegetables and their wares. You know, yeah. The vibe is still the same. Okay, there are more uh, small shops and you know little businesses that have mushroomed all over the place. Uh, some of them have big names attached to them, franchise uh, names and stuff like that. But the vibe is still the same. You, you, the craziness is the same. The madness is the same. The vibe, the excitement. Mm -hmm.